Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Enabling Formulation of Water-Soluble and Water-Insoluble Molecules Using Lipophilic Salt Approach. This is Rita Peters, Editorial Director of Pharmaceutical Technology. I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Pharmaceutical Technology and sponsored by Capsigel. Capsigel designs, develops, and manufactures a wide range of innovative dosage forms for the biopharmaceutical and consumer health and nutrition industries. The company's unique combination of science, engineering, formulation, and capsule expertise enables its customers to optimize the bioavailability, targeted delivery, and overall performance of their products. Capsigel partners with more than 4,000 customers in over 100 countries to create novel, high-quality, and customized solutions that align with our customers' evolving needs and benefit patients and consumers. For more information, visit www.capsigel.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the left-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Huell Williams. Huell, a principal scientist at Capsulgel R&D, works at the Industry Academia Interface with Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences and leads exploratory research in new drug delivery technologies, including lipophilic salts. He's a trained pharmacist with a doctorate in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Nottingham, UK, and is an adjunct research fellow at Monash. He sits on the AAPS Lipid-Based Drug Delivery Systems Focus Group Steering Committee and has authored more than 30 research papers in drug delivery. Thank you for joining us today, Huell. Please begin your presentation. Thank you, Rita, and hello to everyone who has joined this technical webinar. So we'll, we'll be talking about a new platform at Capsigel, namely lipophilic salt technology. And as you will see in my coming slides, this technology offers some new synergy between certain drugs and lipid-based drug delivery, and has the potential to help those currently working in drug development by, for example, improving in vivo absorption and increasing formulation flexibility, whilst it can also unlock new product development opportunities. Before we start, I've included here a one-slide abstract to basically frame together the entire presentation and also to reiterate some of the take-home points. So the objective of lipophilic salt technology is to pair an ionizable drug with a hydrophobic or a lipophilic counter ion. And we do this to change the physico-chemical properties of a compound to potentially overcome performance, design, or process constraints that may become apparent during lipid formulation development. The results we've obtained are clear and are briefly captured in this slide with some snapshot data. Firstly, we found it's possible to produce lipophilic salts for a wide number of ionizable compounds. And this is illustrated on the left in this slide. Uh, and in this compound data set, it's worth pointing out that we have both acidic and basic compounds. BCS class one, two, and three compounds are also represented. And, and in each case, we basically see a big boost in solubility in lipid excipients or lipid formulations when we utilize a lipophilic salt form of the compound. Of course, if we increase solubility in lipid formulations, we can increase drug loading. So we have the potential to overcome a potential design or testing constraint since we could administer higher doses 
or reduce the amount of lipid formulation we need to deliver. Alongside increasing drug loading in lipid formulations, we've also identified uh, kind of a unique synergy between lipophilic salts and lipid formulations, and this is in terms of an in vivo performance synergy. And this is shown on, on the right in this first slide. This is some example data for itraconazole, itraconazole free base suspended as a crystalline form in a lipid formulation demonstrates very low in vivo exposure. However, if we take a lipophilic salt form of the compound and administer it in the same lipid formulation, we see a substantial increase in exposure, and in this case, even higher than the commercial amorphous formulation. So what this is basically saying is that only through the lipophilic salt form of intraconazole can we tap into the true absorption-enhancing benefits of lipid formulation. So there's some nice synergy there in terms of lipophilic salts and lipid vehicles. Okay, let's move to the agenda um, of the presentation. As a backdrop, I will initially outline some of the key bioavailability enhancing technologies that Castiel offers before introducing this concept of technology selection. Then I will introduce lipophilic salt forms to tailor drug properties so that they are better suited to lipid formulations or potentially other formulation approaches. Moving into the core of my presentation, I will outline what lipophilic salts are and how they may be used in drug delivery. Then through the aid of case studies focusing on four different compounds, I hope to convey the enabling utility of this approach in the field of lipid-based drug delivery before summarizing and answering questions on this promising new approach. First, let me give you a, a brief overview of Capsigel's technology platforms and basically where lipid approaches fit in our total offering. Capsigel is a specialized partner to pharmaceutical clients with a focus on addressing bioavailability challenges and modulating pharmacokinetics for challenging compounds. Our depth in technologies allows us not to push any one technology or finished dose, dosage formats. And this, of course, can increase the chance of therapeutic success and or minimize reformulation later in development. We have depth in two key areas, addressing dissolution rate and solubility challenges using micronization, nanomillin, Morphous solid dispersions and liquid-based approaches, for example, liquid-filled hard capsules, soft gels, or lipid multiparticulates. Target delivery is another area of our strength. We utilize an array of technologies to target specific areas of the gut or modulate dissolution rate as required. Increasingly, we have projects that require both solubilization and PK profile modification. Of course, we are known for our capsule encapsulation technologies and offer a range of specialized fit-for-purpose products and approaches in this area. We offer a range of functional caps capsules, for example, our intrinsically enteric capsule, which is increasingly utilized in oral drug delivery. Our model is flexible in that we assist our clients at any stage of development. We offer a full range of preclinical and clinical trial material services. We also supply clients micronized API and drug product intermediate, while of course we supply capsules and we manufacture finished dose formats. As such, clients are increasingly taking advantage of our integrated product development and utilize us from preclinical all the way through phase three and to commercial manufacturing. Capsigel also has a dedicated R&D team, meaning that people like myself work exclusively on developing new technologies and processes. Focusing in now on our bioavailability enhancement portfolio, our core technologies in this area are intentionally complementary, basically in a bid to offer formulation solutions to a wide range of compounds showing orders of magnitude difference in aqueous solubility or lipid partition coefficient. Leveraging our internal databases, compound maps such as the one shown in this slide, and absorption models, candidate compounds can be matched to the most appropriate formulation approach to improve drug absorption. 
In other words, we basically utilize a scientific-based technology selection process. In doing so, we did, however, recognize that some compounds may lie on a technology boundary or lie at the interface of two different technologies. And what this basically can mean is that in some cases a compound cannot fully benefit from the technology, or it means that maybe some constraints, either in terms of formulation design or in formulation processing and manufacture. To that end, we are currently exploring innovative salt forms to modify the physical chemical properties of a drug so that we can basically move compounds from some of the technology boundaries to respective technology sweet spots. And indeed, one area we're looking closely at are those drugs that exhibit high log p-values, say above 3 or 4 or 5, and very low aqueous solubilities combined due to strong solid-state interactions. For these compounds to be well absorbed, they require both solubilization support in the small intestine, but also delivery in a non-crystalline form to overcome solid-state barriers to drug dissolution. Now, whilst this area is potentially ripe for lipid formulations, low compound solubility in oils and other excipients is particularly limiting to development, particularly when the dose is high. Lipophilic salts, or what we previously referred to as ionic liquids, is a technology being co-developed by Katzegel and Monash University, both leaders in lipid-based chemistry, formulation, and biopharmaceutics. The technology has the ability to greatly expand the formulation space of lipid formulations. Working closely with professors Chris Porter and Peter Scammels at Monash, we launched a new collaborative program in 2015 to understand the fundamentals of this approach and mature the technology ahead of wider use. So lipophilic salts essentially consist of an API anion or cation that is iron paired with a lipophilic counter ion. These salts can be prepared in a number of different ways, but we routinely apply salt metathesis reactions to isolate our lipophilic salts. This is basically a salt interchange reaction where, for example, for a basic drug, we mix the hydrochloride salt in a solvent or a solvent mixture with the sodium salt of the lipophilic counterion. We get high yields using this approach to produce our salts since it's largely driven by the production of the inorganic salt byproduct, which may be sodium chloride or potassium chloride, depending on the starting materials. As I've said, yields are high, it's also scalable, and we can also produce salts at the milligram quantity to, to explore salt feasibility. As we might expect, the physical form of lipophilic salts can vary widely, ranging from viscous oils at room temperature to stable amorphous powders through to waxes and free-flowing crystalline powders. Those salts that exhibit a melting point or a glass transition below 100 degrees centigrade can also be classed as an API ionic liquid. Ionic liquids are receiving an increasing amount of attention in drug delivery research, in part to, due to their diverse physical properties. The term, or the broader term, lipophilic salt, inc therefore includes ionic liquids, but it is broader since that it's not restrained by the salt melting point. Whether the lipophilic salt is isolated as an oil or crystalline powder reflects the ability of the salt to pack together at the molecular level. And we've generally found this to be dependent on the intrinsic solid state properties of the free drug, coupled with the properties of the lipophilic counter ion. So what are the potential applications and advantages of lipophilic salts in oral drug delivery? There is a potential to enhance dramatically drug solubility in organic solvents, and that can help processing for different formulation technologies. We can improve drug physical stability, particularly where salts are isolated as viscous oils or oils since there is no stable crystalline form. Dual function salts is an exciting and an interesting area where, for example, the compound, which of course has a pharmacological effect, is paired together with a with a counter ion 
with some therapeutic action also, for example, a sweetening agent for taste masking. Lipophilic salts can also enable life cycle management op op options for existing drugs, such as liquid-filled capsules for consumer health or anti-counterfeit applications as well. But for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on lipophilic salts to optimize the use of lipid formulations. So I'm going to be talking a fair bit about lipophilic salts enhancing drug solubility in lipid excipients. And to understand the relationship between solid state properties of salts and lipid solubility, we need to revisit some of the thermodynamic principles that underpin solubility. For any solute to enter into solution, we need to break the solid state into actions so that we can release a single molecule of drug. And in doing so, this requires energy, and the amount of energy correlates approximately to the melting point of the drug. In turn, we need to create a void space within the solvent into which the uh, drug molecule can enter. That requires energy, but overall that amount is, is generally negligible. Energy is released as the molecule L enters into the solvent, but it's important to note that the amount of energy that is released is very dependent on the type of interactions, intermolecular interactions that are formed. In aqueous systems, high energies of solvation can drive the dissolution process and overcome potentially high melting points. For example, hydrogen bonding and electrostatic ion pairing interactions with aqueous systems. But in hydrophobic vehicles such as simple oils, those types of interactions aren't possible. And we're basically forming hydrophobic van der Waals interactions and thus lower energy. And what this basically means is that higher um, melting points and strong solid state interactions in the compound can severely limit solubility in simple oils. So you typically see, typically see a strong negative correlation between compound melting point and solubility in simple oils. And that's basically how lipophilic salts work to enhance lipid solubility since we're able to effectively reduce melting point. So we're reducing strength of solid state interactions and we can dramatically increase solubility in lipidic excipients and lipid formulations. So let's review some of the solubility data sets that we've generated thus far. In this slide, we're reviewing 13 compounds, including acidic compounds and basic compounds. And as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, BCS 1, 2, and 3 classes. On the x-axis, we have the melting point of the free compound plotted against solubility in either a lipidic excipient or kind of a standard lipid formulation. We see the solubility is generally limited to 100 milligrams per gram, and in fact, in most cases, it's below 50 milligrams per gram, although there are a couple of exceptions. Now, when we prepare a lipophilic salt form of this compound, we basically see a substantial increase in solubility in lipidic excipients as shown here now by the corresponding green data points. And next to the green data points, we have the measured melting point or glass transition of that lipophilic salt. So we see in all cases an improvement in lipid solubility, and in some cases it can be dramatic. 10, 50, even 100-fold increases in solubility are possible using the lipophilic salt approach. So now I'd like to go through some of the case studies that we've worked on at Monash University in collaboration, of course, with Gel. The first case study um, was recently presented in a publication last year, and it focused on scenarios in ezetriconazole as kind of example model compounds showing uh, low aqueous solubility and low absorption in vivo. So in terms of the basic properties of these two compounds, both exhibit high log P values, so at the outset, you would suggest that they are good candidates for lipid formulations. So narazine has reasonable solubility in lipid excipients as the free base, around about 50 milligrams per gram. Itraconazole, however, whilst being poorly soluble in water, is also very poorly soluble in lipids. And maximum load is around about 5 milligrams per gram, um, unless you're developing a, a lipid suspension, that is. So the question 
the start of this program are lipophilic salt forms of cinnarabine and triconazole increasingly lipid soluble. And therefore, can we use this to enhance drug loading in lipid formulations for these particular compound types? Focusing initially on, on cinnarabine, we screened a number of different um, acidic counterions, and we prepared several novel salts of cinnarazine, and just four are listed in this slide with respective melting points or glass transition. Whenever we prepare lipophilic salts, we verify that we do have a salt form by protein NMR. Cinnarazine desyl sulfate was taken as kind of a, an interesting lipophilic salt, given that it formed a very uh, kind of a viscous oil, and this was stable at room temperature for several years in storage. We also found that lipophilic salts of cinnarazine and also triconazole enhance solubility in lipid formulations. And there was a general correlation between melting point of the salt and the overall enhancement in lipid solubility. On the left, we see that cinnarazine solubility was just under 50 milligrams per gram, whereas cinnarazine desyl sulfate and cinnarazine loyal sulfate, the solubility was in excess of 200 milligrams per gram. And all these concentrations are in equivalent free base concentrations. In the case of cinnarazine desyl sulfate, the solubility was, in fact, um, uh, not the, the maximum solubility. We were basically uh, near miscibility in, in many different lipid formulations. So we saw a big solubility boost with cinnarazine lipophilic salts. Equally, were the results, uh, equally promising were the results with itraconazole on the right-hand side, itraconazole oil sulfate, at a melting point of about 150 degrees, and we saw a big increase in solubility. But then itraconazole docusate was much more lipid soluble, ostensibly due to a lower melting point. So we confirmed that we can produce lipophilic salts for both cinnarazine and itraconazole, and both of these uh, new salt forms showed substantially enhanced solubility in lipid excipients, and that translated to increased drug loading potential. So the next question you ask then, can lipophilic salts and lipid formulations support higher doses in vivo and support increased absorption? So let's review some in vivo data for cinnarazine. First of all, cinnarazine as an aqueous suspension, the free base that is, crystalline suspension, was very poorly absorbed. A lipid formulation containing cinnarazine free base dissolved to a lipid solution type sets at 35 milligrams per kilogram did boost drug absorption, suggesting and confirming that lipid formulations can promote absorption of this compound. But based on the amount of formulation we were able to dose, and based on drug loading and solubility of cinnarazine free base in the formulation, we were limited up to a 35 milligram per kilogram dose when using cinnarazine free base. We could increase dose if by moving to a uh, to a lipid suspension type formulation, and we increased exposure at 125 milligrams per kilogram. But by using the lipophilic salt form, cinnarazine desyl sulfate, we could also achieve higher exposure at that same dose. So in comparison to the lipidic suspension, using the lipophilic salt, we did see an increased exposure. So if for this particular case study for cinnarazine, we're able to increase the amount of drug that's being dosed as a milligram per kilogram basis, and we're also able to keep exposure increasing also much better than that can be achieved using the, the free form of the compound. Promising in vivo data for scenarioing was also supported by in vitro performance tests, and I've just briefly summarized some of the take-home points in this slide. The very high concentrations uh, obtainable using the lipophilic salt in the lipid formulation remain effectively solubilized during our standard in vitro performance tests, so a dispersion and a digestion test, as shown in this slide. However, if you did allow the, the, the dispersed and digested formulation to reside at 37 degrees for an extended time period, over 24 hours, there was eventual crystallization of, of cinnarazine, and we confirmed that these were cinnarazine's pre brace crystals. And that basically tells us that there is progressive dissociation of the salt complex at pH 6.5, and that would lead to um, limited effects on, 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 on decrease in drug absorption through a salt complex. So that overall was a promising result also. 
reviewing once again the in vivo data set for chiconazole, we dosed, first of all, the free base uh, as a crystalline lipidic expansion, suspension. So given the fact that this compound had very poor solubility in lipids, it was needed to be dosed as a lipid suspension when used in the free form. And as I've said, exposure was very low. However, then on increasing um, drug loading through the lipophilic salt, in the same lipid formulation, we see the dramatic increase in, in drug exposure. So basically, the lipophilic salt is tapping into this absorption-enhancing potential of the lipid formulation. And at least in the rat model, we were higher than the commercial uh, amorphous solid dispersion formulation for this particular compound. In terms of mechanistically, uh, what is happening here, we also found that drug solubility um, of the lipophilic salt for itraconazole was substantially increased in the dispersed and digested lipid formulation. So what this basically means is though, although we can increase drug loading in lipid formulation, we're not generating a mass of supersaturation that leads to drug precipitation. We're effectively increasing drug solubilization in the intestinal colloids as well. And this can't be achieved with the free base. There's also some synergy between lipophilic salt and solubilization with the intestine and that translates to increased drug absorption. But the key take-home point for itraconazole in this particular case study is that only the lipophilic salt form of the compound could access the absorption benefits of lipid formulations. Just to summarize this first case study of cinarazine in itraconazole, we prepared highly lipid-soluble salts of cinarazine in itraconazole in terms of how much we increased drug loading, this was at least 3.5-fold. In the case of Jaconazole, it was, in fact, more like 10 and 50-fold. Higher loadings allowed higher drug doses to be administered in vivo with no increase in formulation mass. That relates to the Sinarazine case study. We also confirmed that the salt form is needed. Um, in data not shown, a simple drug counter ion mixture didn't lead to any substantial changes in pharmacokinetics. Lipophilic salts formulated in the formulation supported dose escalation studies in preclinical testing and by limiting the amount of formulation that can be uh, and needs to be administered, and that was shown in the Cinarazine study. Due to enhanced exposure, lipophilic salts also support ongoing development with bioavailability increase and dose reduction potential, and that relates to the Echoconazole case study there. Moving on to some more recent data. Uh, generated within the collaboration between Capsule and Monash. I'd like to focus on allotinib and gefitinib. We're using these compounds as example kinase inhibitors, uh, since many compounds in this class demonstrate low uh, exposure, potentially variable exposure as well. They often suffer from moderate or extensive food effects and interactions with acid-reducing agents. In working with more and more compounds uh, in this particular technology, we've begun to kind of glean some of the edges of these applications, and we basically perform uh, a risk assessment before we analyze any new compounds. For basic compounds, weekly basic compounds, two factors that we consider are the melting point of the free form as well as the basic pKa. Based on the properties of allotinib and chafitinib, and, and the simple risk assessment, both were considered good candidates for the technology going forward. We screened a number of different salts, two salts um, for allotinib and docusate that looked particularly interesting going forward to lipid formulation exploratory testing were allotinib docusate and chafitinib docusate. In the case of the allotinib, the initial batch that we generated was uh, a viscous yellow oil that had a glass transition of less than 10 degrees. We basically optimized the preparation process and scaled it up somewhat, and we basically yielded a, a crystalline powder. Yields were great. Um, residual solvent levels were low as well. It just speaks to the fact that we have to be careful when preparing new salts that we're not slipping into a metastable state. Equally for Jafitinib, we produced a, a white powder um, and like with allotinib, it was a, a free-flowing powder that could be easily handled. In our pre-formulation step, we've also implemented a characterization workflow to, to basically analyze our new salt forms, both physically and chemically. The first step we do is confirm 
that our mixture contains a, uh, a, a new salt form, and essentially we use protein NMR and FTAR to confirm this. Then we look at the physical form and the melting properties of the salts. And in terms of allotinib docusate and gefitinib docusate, both were confirmed as crystalline and depolarized light micros micro microscopy and XRD. And in terms of the melting point, a lot of docusate had a melting point of approximately 71 degrees, whereas gefitinib, this was 96 degrees. And in both cases, the melting point reduction was approximately 100 degrees compared to the free, co free compound. Focusing on solubility of the um, allotinib salts and gefitinib salts in lipidic excipients now. Allotinib hydrochloride is very poorly soluble in, in both oils, surfactants, and co-solvents. The free base does offer a slight increase in solubility, uh, but this is particularly relevant in co-solvent type excipients such as PEG 400. But as we can see in the left-hand side, allotinib docusate uh, was much more lipid soluble, hitting a target solubility of 150 milligrams per gram equivalent free base in seven, several different lipidic excipients. And this is quite interesting that it has um, solubility, high solubility values across a number of different types of excipients. And that's useful to development as well, that we don't only have solubility or high solubility in one particular excipient type. I'll also add that all of these solubility values are supported by at least three months physical stability in several different excipients as well, just to confirm that we don't have any crystallization or physical instability on time after the solubility study. We had equally promising results for gefitinib. Gefitinib free base, because of its high melting point, is very poorly soluble in oils and, and several different excipients. But again, the docusate salt had a target solubility of 150 milligrams per gram in several, several different excipients as well. So this is basically telling us that with the docusate salts for these two compounds, we have substantial enhancement in drug loading capacity in lipid formulations. As a routine test now, we're also measuring the organic solvent solubility of our lipidic salts since we realize this can off, potentially offer some advantages in formulation processing, such as spray-dried solid dispersions. Just reviewing a small data set here, just to illustrate, the free base of gefitinib demonstrates very low solubility in several different organic solvents used in spray drying, where gefitinib docustate exhibits solubility above 10% weight, that is 100 milligrams per gram, in several different um, solvents, in all the solvents tested, in fact, and equally good results were obtained with allotinib free base, uh, sorry, allotinib docusate over the free base form. To better understand the colloidal fate of lipophilic salts in the GI tract, we've also developed a new water lipid partitioning model. In brief, we have the compound or salt form of the compound incorporated in a type 1 uh, lipid formulation. So this is a non-self emulsifying formulation, so it will disperse to form a coarse emulsion. The drug loading in the formulation is intentionally kept low to minimize the risk of drug precipitation. And basically, we perform a dynamic dispersion with change in pH. And we use just simple centrifugation to separate the formulation phase from the water phase, and we quantify the amount of drug in the water phase as a function of pH to better understand where is the compound preferentially solubilized on moving, for example, from the acidic stomach to the uh, more neutral intestine of the, small in uh, of the small intestine. This is useful to understand in relation to performance, supports rational formulation design. It can also allow us to, to select appropriate count ions, and it gives us insights into varied gastric pH and pH gradients on salt partitioning. Some of the preliminary results we obtained for allotinib docusate are presented in this slide, and, and they are very interesting. On the left, we've got a, a snapshot of the results for the free base. A pH2 weekly basic allotinib free base is predominantly ionized, and thus it's predominantly solubilized within the water phase. 
Well, however, on moving to pH 6.5, where the compound is now unionized, it's much more lipophilic and now is predominantly uh, solubilized within the formulation, the lipid phase. In contrast, the allotinib docusate salt form, as you can see, across a wider range of pH, is predominantly solubilized within the, uh, the formulation lipid phase. At pH 2 and 3, what's happening here is the compound is predominantly ionized, but it's complex with the docusate counter ion. And based on the lipophilicity of the counter ion, it's, it's more associated with the lipid formulation phase. So the implication here from these results is the use of lipophilic salts and lipid-based formulation colloids can shelter allotative and other compounds from changing pH conditions in the GI tract, potentially avoiding crystallization of poorly soluble drugs. Also, to better understand the performance of lipophilic salts and lipid formulations, we've also implemented a two-step digestion test that consists of, first of all, an acidic dispersion phase and then an intestinal digestion phase. So sharing some of the preliminary results we've obtained using this method, using allotinib docusate containing lipid formulations, we find effective solubilization at very high concentrations at acidic pH, and this is where the drug will be preferentially uh, complex with a lipophilic counter ion. On moving to intestinal pH, there's two driving forces for supersaturation generation. That is the increase in pH and reduction in drug solubility, and also the digestion of the lipid formulation. We do, in, in one case, see considerable precipitation of the free base form of, of allotinib. However, we are able to fix this and eliminate precipitation by changing uh, the composition of the formulation and impacting its digestibility. So one of the take-home points here is that um, by using lipophilic salts, because of the high solubility across a number of different lipidic excipients, we're afforded some flexibility in our formulation choices and we're able to address um, certain things such as a high precipitation, precipitation risk by changing formulation composition. And you can't often do that when you have low solubility in lipid excipients or preferential solubility towards different excipient types. So to summarize this second case study on allotinib and gefitinib, uh, these compounds are representative of a number of drugs showing slow, variable, or low absorption food effects, and interactions with acid-reducing agents. These biopharmaceutical issues may potentially be solved by lipid formulations, but they're often not considered. This technology is not often considered because of low solubility in simple lipidic excipients. Lipophilic salt forms, however, are better suited to lipid, for, lipid formulation development. We have substantially improved solubility in lipidic excipients supported by uh, at least three months physical stability are concentrations above 100 milligrams per gram. And this translates to approximately a tenfold increase in loading potential in lipid formulations. And as I've mentioned, increased formulation flexibility is another advantage. We have improved, improved solubilization at acidic pH, plus the potential to limit precipitation in the intestine by sheltering drug from neutral pH. New lipophilic salts also offer substantial improvements in organic solvent solubility. I give some data there, offering potentially process-related advantages in solid dispersion manufacture. So just moving to the final summary and the take-home points. Lipophilic salts is an approach to transform drugs to better candidates for lipid formulation development. We will potentially have the optimized use of lipid formulations, for example, for enhanced oral absorption for a range of drugs. So using this technique, we have increased feasibility of generating lipid solutions at high doses. As I've demonstrated, high drug loadings are possible, 10 to 40% are common, meaning less excipient, fewer capsules. We can also change the drug affinity towards the lipid colloidal phase for improved solubilization and absorption. The approach is applicable for both weak acids and bases. Today, we focused mainly on poorly water-soluble drugs, but it's also applicable to water-soluble compounds as well. Combined with the right formulation approach, lipophilic salts offer new and exciting opportunities in drug development in terms of liquid-filled capsules, lipid multiparticulates, 
and spray dried solid dispersions. So with that, I'd like to hand back to Rita Peters so we can move into the Q&A session of this webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ewell, for that informative presentation. Uh, we will get to the Q&A in just a moment, uh, but first, a few notes. Uh, first, reminder to the audience, uh, you can take a look at the resources available from the sponsor. They're located in the green resource widget below your presentation window. Um, next, we want to do a brief polling question, so you can click, click directly on the screen to submit your answer. And the question is, would you like Capsigel to follow up with you after the webinar? Uh, yes or no? Again, would you like Capsigel, Capsigel to follow up with you after the webinar? Yes or no? And we'll give that a few more seconds. All right, great. Thanks for answering that. Uh, now let's go on to the question and answer session. A uh, reminder to the audience, you can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. And we'll get to as many questions as we can. So here's our first question. Um, Huel, what are your thoughts about using this technology in reducing water solubility by increasing lipid solubility, and hence forming a slow-dissolving sustained release motif, which can be dosed either oral dose or intravenous or subcutaneous? Yeah, thanks, Rita, and, uh, and thanks for that question. Uh, it is possible, uh, and I believe there is some literature uh, that already exists in this topic, for example, by using uh, a salt approach to decrease aqueous solubility and then in turn decrease rate of absorption, typically orally, but I believe, also believe subcutaneous as well. Um, focusing on salts and oil delivery, um, this perhaps would only work using a standard tablet formulation if the salt remains, uh, let's say, pro predominantly associated with the countine across a broad range of, of, of pH. Since it's not, then the drug can rapidly enter, absorption, uh, enter solution and then rapidly be absorbed. Um, and also in this approach, perhaps it's a little bit susceptible to intersubject pH variations. So thinking about this uh, a little bit more, one way to potentially overcome this uh, in terms of variability, um, in terms of pH plus the need to remain associated with the, with the counter and across a broad pH range, is to, and also then to maximize sustained release, is to have um, both the salt having reduced aqueous solubility, but also increased affinity towards a lipid or waxy matrix formulation phase. So in this case, we have kind of sustained release potential from a combined approach, not only uh, reduced aqueous solubility of a lipophilic salt, uh, but also increased affinity towards uh, a formulation phase that, for example, is, is slowly eroding within the, um, within the GI tract. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, here's our next question. Uh, do we have to manufacture these salts in situ, or can an API manufacturer manufacture it ready for use? Thanks, Rita. So um, as I outlined in the presentation, our current approach is to manufacture the salts uh, in the first instance. So we typically use a salt metastasis reaction, uh, and we approach it like any conventional salt preparation technique. So we prepare the salt, and then we expose that salt to kind of a standard uh, physical chemical categorization um, workflow. Uh, and then basically then it can be used, uh, explored in, in, for example, different lipid formulations, um, potentially other formulation platforms. We've begun to look at um, spray dried solid dispersions. Um, Kind of salt preparation in situ is is complex uh, and it, it is something we're looking at. But when you begin to consider uh, in situ preparation in, in lipid formulations, we're we're approaching um, significant levels of complexity, and, and we feel at, at present, based on the, the compound we've looked at, to kind of maximise the the benefits of the salt approach. And the salt approach is is truly enabling to to the formulation. Um, it's it's better to prepare the salt in the first instance. Uh, and one thing I will stress is that, you know, the chemistry isn't overly complex. We're not producing new covalent forms of compounds here. It's basic um, salt chemistry, and all we're producing is, is lipophilic salt. 
Okay, thank you. Um, what are some of the factors you take into consideration when you select counter ions to prepare your salt? So um, there's a great deal number of factors since the counter ion can not only impact the physical form of the compound, um, but also um, its affinity towards different lipids and its affinity towards colloids in the GI tract. Uh, and basically, as part of past and ongoing work, we have a much better understanding of kind of our preferred counter ions, and we've also established, or begin to establish, I should say, a rational counter ion selection process that's largely based on com compound properties, but also um, some of the objectives we're trying to achieve with the lipophilic salt approach. <coughs> Excuse me. So some of the kind of counter ion selection criteria could include, um, we're focusing uh, on counter ions that have past use in drug delivery as counter ions or excipients or, or basic additives. We also need um, the counter ion to have an opposite charge relative to the drug. A uh, high log P value is preferred, particularly to enable melting point depression and increase affinity towards the lipid formulation phase. <clears throat> molecular symmetry in the counter ion is particularly useful to reduce dense uh, molecular packet. So that's a great way to drive down uh, solid state interactions and, and decrease melting point to reduce potentially uh, liquid salts or low melting salts. And basic hydrophobicity does promote lipid solubility because it can decrease hydrogen bonding potential between um, the counter ions themselves as well as the compound as well. All right, thank you. Um, could you comment on this technology in contrast to solid dispersion, advantages, ease of development, et cetera? Yes, of course. So at Capsule Gel Boys, obviously, we have broad um, capabilities from development through the manufacture in both uh, lipid-based technologies as well as SDDs. <coughs> um, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, one area we're interested in applying this technology is the compounds that have both low crystalline solubility due to high melting point, so strong solid state interactions, but also those compounds that have high log p-values. What that basically means for these compounds is they, they typically have uh, what we refer to uh, boundary limited um, absorption. So the, the absorption, or I should say the diffusion across the unstirred water layer in the small intestine can be particularly slow for these compounds. Uh, and one way to promote this is to is to um, use bile salt phospholipid micelles to shuttle the drug across these um, unsealed water layer to the side of absorption. And we know very well that lipid formulations uh, can, in that regard, greatly promote drug absorption of high log P compounds. <clears throat> so we basically realized this kind of sweet spots for the, two, uh, for the different formulation approaches to enhance absorption. And what the lipophilic salt is doing is really enabling us to use lipid formulations uh, more broadly. But that is a good question, and we are beginning to do kind of head-to-head -head technology comparisons, both in vitro and in vivo, just to um, nail down a little bit more on this in terms of the technology sweet spot. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's our next question. Can lipophilic salts be used orally without lipid formulation? Thank you, Rita. Um, in theory, yes. Uh, and we are in the process of performing some in vitro and in vivo studies to compare the performance of lipid formulations compared to unformulated salts, as well as other formulation platforms like SDDs, as we've already um, covered. <clears throat> we are also aware of some other groups who are looking at API ionic liquids or lipophilic salts to improve solubility and dissolution of some compounds. However, we've typically found that um, our novel salts typically will display poor weatherability and dispersibility in an aqueous environment when unformulated or in the absence of any additional lipid or, or, so, uh, or surfactant or perhaps co-solvent. So we basically found if you want optimal solubilization of your, of your new salt form, it's best to co-formulate with a solubilizing enhancing formulation approach typically. Uh, and our focus and our best results have been obtained using a lipid formulation. So, of course, in many cases, if, if, the, if the salt form is a crystalline powder, you can, you can 
formulate it as a powder and capsule or potentially a tablet. Having said that, to get um, arguably the best um, absorption, particularly if the compound is poorly water soluble and intrinsically poorly water soluble, best to formulate it with a solubility enhancing platform as well. Uh, thank you. Um, what are some of the best types of candidate molecules for this technology? So this is uh, an area of focus for us uh, at the moment uh, at Capsigel and at Monash. And I'd say we've made some significant progress in this area. Obviously, we're looking at salts. So you could say broadly, ionizable compounds are applicable. Um, but then where the technology is broadly enabling, so what is the salt bringing to, to the table? That's, that's what we really need to focus on. And obviously, enhancing absorption uh, and bioavailability um, is is key, uh, particularly in conjunction with lipid formulation. So um, good candidates for, for the technology are those that are firstly ionizable, but then show low aquasolubility, uh, particularly in the small intestine, because that's obviously the primary sort of drug absorption. And also, as I mentioned, the high log p-values. Um, alongside that, you know, need to, to use um, formulation technologies to improve drug absorption. Um, if the, if the objective is just to enhance solubility in lipid excipients, for example, to increase the feasibility of producing liquid fill capsule options, then this technology is also applicable to those compounds also. Thank you. Uh, here's, here's another question for you. Um, what excipients have been looked into to solubilize these salts? So we've looked at a diverse range of excipients. I imagine the question is, is focused towards uh, lipidic excipients. So um, we uh, at CAPS-GL have um, kind of an internal database uh, of excipients that we would look at in which we would have basic triglycerides of, of different ch chain lengths and chemistries through to kind of partial glycerides, monoglycerides, um, high gel B cosurfactants, high gel B surfactants. And, and some some co-solvents as well. And typically, we would do uh, what we call a kinetic solubility screen to to assess the the, the relative affinity of our salts uh, towards these excipients uh, relative to our free form or conventional salt forms. And we would use that kinetic kinetic solubility screen to identify kind of the basic components um, that we would kind of take forward into a formulation development um, step. So we basically do look at a broad range of, of excipients, making sure that we hit um, kind of basic oils and then different HLB surfactants uh, and also co-solvents as well. And with the data sets I presented for um, allotinib and, and gefitinib, uh, it was quite interesting to note that <coughs> yeah, we, with the lipophilic salts, we often see kind of this enhanced affinity and, and increased solubility across a broad range of excipient types. Uh, and that's quite in contrast to some basic solubility trends that you might see um, with, with, let's say, free base compounds, where you might see preferential affinity towards high HLB surfactants and, and co-solvents. What we find is with lipophilic salt is you can kind of normalize almost the, the high affinity towards a broader range of excipients. So that's one of the reasons why we also make sure in our um, excipient selection process, we do factor in different excipient types based on hydrophobicity and um, and things like that. All right, thank you. Um, can lipophilic salts improve in intestinal permeability? Yeah, look, that's a that's a really interesting question, and uh, and also it's been a question I think that's been posed uh, for a long time. I think there's some papers that date back to kind of the late seventies looking at iron pairing of, of low permeability compounds um, with varying degrees of success, I would say. So uh, I think to answer that question, we need to think about what, what are we actually trying to do. So um, we know that compound charge, uh, the intestinal pH, can be limited to absorption. So the possibility of, of masking that charge through an interaction with an opposite, oppositively charged counterion could, in theory, improve intestinal perm permeability. Uh, and for that to work, we would need a situation where both the drug and counter are charged simultaneously at intestinal pH. 
They're perhaps only relevant for acidic compounds or strongly basic compounds. Uh, in our studies to date, we've not seen any direct evidence to suggest that we are increasing um, the passive uptake of, of compounds through the lipophilic salt. Um, though it is possible that drug can remain associated with the counterine in free solution, as well as obviously within the colloids in the small intestine, <clears throat> there obviously will be some continued uh, dilution with GI fluids. And, and other factors then may push the equilibrium towards the free dissociated form of the, of the salt, so basically liberating the free drug. Um, so it's hard to say with, with, with confidence that we would have a profound effect on, on absorption. And I think if we were to see any significant effect, the, the overall permeability of the salt would need to be substantially higher than the permeability of the, of the free drug. So it's a difficult question to answer, and it's something we're considering. Uh, but we don't have any direct evidence at this time to support that we can address permeability-limited absorption. Well, thank you very much, Yul, for uh, taking those questions and for your presentation today. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Capsigel, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September of next year. You'll receive an email from Pharmaceutical Technology alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Also, if you could take a few moments right now and complete our sponsor's brief survey once this webinar concludes. Thank you for joining us today, and see you next time.